Hi everyone, uh, my name is Saurav Malhotra and I'm a Solutions Engineer with CoreOS and I'm going to be uh, leading the presentation today. Um, just as a, as a side note, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit those. Uh, you'll see them in your screen in BrightTalk and we'll definitely make sure to uh, get those questions uh, at the end of the presentation as well as follow up. Um, so today the presentation topic is key considerations for migrating from Docker Swarm to Kubernetes with uh, CoreOS Tectonic. And um, uh, CoreOS kind of has a unique point of view on, uh, on how to do this migration successfully and how to be successful with Kubernetes. Um, and we have this view essentially because, you know, we've been a, a big part in this space, in kind of this open source space and container management space, as well as working with distributed systems for quite some time. And we've also helped a lot of uh, customers in their journey to be successful with uh, adopting Kubernetes. Um, so let's uh, briefly describe kind of who CoreOS is and why, you know, that's the company that, that uh, you should be working with as you kind of go through your journey. Um, you know, just like in the years past, everybody's probably familiar with this story, you know, VMs essentially changed the way that infrastructure was deployed for the last, uh, you know, 15 years or so. The same way containerization is kind of changing the way applications are deployed. Um, and, and folks are starting to manage and run their applications with Kubernetes, and they're doing that to stay competitive. It's starting to become a de facto standard, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, the, what you see here basically is that already today about 20% of the companies are global enterprises are running containerized applications, container, containerized workloads in production and that's going to continue to grow and get all the way up to 50% uh, within the next, next couple of years. And uh, CoreOS as a company has been leading this, the, this space for quite some time pretty much since the beginning um, and contributing a lot in, in this space as well. We basically released some of the, the fundamental building blocks of Kubernetes and distributed systems. We have um, built the, the data store that, uh, that backs Kubernetes. We've just defined some of the networking standards as well as the, the protocols, as well as uh, the security standards and protocols. All right, so essentially if you're thinking about containers, if you're thinking about Kubernetes, you're, you're definitely uh, listening to the right company. <laughs> and I'll share our experience and kind of our approach in this discussion. But first, uh, let's take a look at kind of what the agenda will be for the, the rest of this presentation here. Um, so when I'm talking about Docker Swarm, which Docker Swarm am I talking about, right? We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Then we'll jump into has, has Kubernetes won? Right? And I kind of answer that question in the next slide, which is uh, why is Kubernetes winning, right? And, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about kind of what some of the comparisons and contrasting resources and, and things that you should be thinking about as you're, as you're um, migrating from uh, Docker Swarm onto Kubernetes and so on. And then also talk about um, the journey that uh, some of our customers has gone, have gone on uh, with us as they're, as they're um, rolled Kubernetes into production. All right, next slide here. So basically when we're talking about, uh, and I know that there's a, probably a screen delay here, so maybe I should pause after I change slides, but uh, so basically when, uh, when we're talking about Docker Swarm, you know, there could be some confusion, like which one are you talking about? There was a Swarm that originally came out, then there was a Swarm mode, which was based on uh, Swarm kit, and then there's also different editions of this, community edition as well as enterprise edition, and then enterprise edition comes with a few different flavors and so on. Um, so I'm focusing mostly on Swarm mode and mostly on Community Edition. I will touch a little bit upon uh, Enterprise Edition as well, uh, just as I'm doing some comparisons and so forth. So forth. But for the most part, we'll, we're talking about uh, Community Edition uh, is what we're what the focus will be. All right. And um, so when we talk about kind of Kubernetes and the Kubernetes and this orchestration space, has Kubernetes already? already won that orchestration battle, right? It, that's, that's definitely a, a question that comes up pretty often. And I think there's different ways to look at it. One way that folks like to look at it is just overall participation from, from the community, right? So um, as well as kind of what's happening on, on, in, on the different projects, right? So here you can see the, the three major projects, the number of commits, you can look at that, you can look at the number of contributors, you can look at the number of stars that are there quite a few different ways to look at it. And there's also some ancillary projects that are related to these. You can start kind of aggregating those numbers. But pretty much whatever, whichever way you look at it, you can see that Kubernetes is essentially running away with it, right? The, the participation in the community is definitely way above all the others. And it's, Kubernetes is kind of on a, on a league of its own at this point um, from like the, the pace that it's moving and the growth that it's seeing in, in uh, capabilities and so on. Um, the other thing you'll notice is pretty much 
all the vendors, whether they're cloud vendors, have started to jump on the bandwagon. Um, you know, and, and even some of the other orchestration platforms have started to essentially wave the white flag. Um, and, and essentially saying that it's you know they're, it's, inev it's, inev it's inevitable and they have to have to take on uh, Kubernetes and, and support Kubernetes mm -hmm. instead of trying to fight against it, right? Uh, so yes, I would say that the battle is over. <laughs> that, uh, that Kubernetes is sitting on top, and, and uh, not just the battle, but but the war is over at this point. Um, and Kubernetes has pretty much won the orchestration space. So when we're specifically talking about um, uh, Kubernetes against uh, against Swarm. Why why is it why why did Kubernetes win? Right? What is the, what are the reasons for that? Um, you know, Docker as a, as kind of the project as well as the company definitely made containers very very easy to adopt and made them very popular for sure. They did that really well. But Google has been was running containerized applications at scale for over a decade. And uh, a lot of the, the capability and kind of the the, um, um, the know-how that Google had uh, learned by doing that was uh, was leveraged when Kubernetes was starting to, to be built out, right? So it, what it created was a, a better, more feature-rich platform that had kind of scale uh, as well as production grade in mind, right? So that's kind of what I have on the left here. Then on the right-hand side, the other thing that's also key with what ha what's happening with Kubernetes is that there are a lot of plug-and-play components that give you very tight integrations and make it easy for you to customize, right? So not only is it customizable, but it also all that stuff kind of fits really well together. Uh, but I think the key thing is what's in the middle here, right? The Kubernetes project definitely um, uh, had the community in mind first, right? It was definitely handled differently, um, where, you know, Google, when it was open source, it became part of the nonprofit, you know, Linux Foundation, and it went under the CNCF, uh, which is where it sits today. Uh, whereas on the flip side, on the, on the Docker side, there was definitely a lot of uh, clash with the community where Docker tried to hold on um, to the project for a very long time. Even today, Docker Swarm is essentially a single vendor, right, solution. Um, and if you want any of the enterprise features, you pretty much just have to go to Docker for that. Um, even the way it was released when it came out, it was bundled, you know, as part of, uh, uh, at one point it was bundled as, as part of the, the Docker engine, which, you know, wasn't a, didn't go over very well in the community. Um, so I think the community first aspect definitely was key here uh, into, into the adoption and kind of the growth that we're seeing with Kubernetes. So let's kind of jump in a little bit and start talking about some of the specifics here of, of comparing some things, and then we'll I'll also, uh, after this, uh, get into a little bit of a demo and actually show you a few things and commands and, and deploying and so forth, so we'll have some fun there. Um, so let's talk about mapping some concepts. Uh, so on the left-hand side, Kubernetes, I'm gonna dig in a little more on the Kubernetes side, and then uh, also touch on the Swarm side. I'm assuming that most of the folks that are attending this um, have some familiarity with Swarm, and, and they're attending this because they want to know what it would be like if they were to be on the Kubernetes side of the, the house, right? Um, so, at, uh, in Kubernetes, kind of the smallest primitive that you can have, the smallest deployable object is a pod, uh, where, uh, which is kind of the thing that holds the container or multiple containers, depending on if those containers need to live together. Um, it also defines kind of the storage or the network IP space. That's similar to kind of a task that you would have on the Swarm side, which is a, the smallest atomic kind of scheduling unit that has uh, the container definition as well as the commands to run inside the container. Um, uh, next on the Kubernetes side, deployment. So this is how you declare a uh, what you want to actually deploy, right? So you declare a desired state for the pods, as well as kind of the number of replicas for that pod. How many do you want to don't you want to run? You can also define a lot of other things as well, but that's kind of the, the bare minimum that you need to define, right? You can define things like you know volumes and storage and so on. Uh, quite a, quite quite a lot you can do there, but bare minimum that's what you need. Um, Similar to the service definition that you create inside of Swarm, which is how you define a task, right? And it's also kind of the primary interface into Swarm. Um, then you have replica sets. So as you do a deployment with Kubernetes, you get a, a replica set that's created that defines the number of pod replicas that are going to be running um, and, and that are going to be running at, at a given time. And you can scale that up and scale that down after you've created the deployment as well. Uh, the similar concept would be the replica, which defines essentially the scale or, again, the number of tasks that are going to be running for a service. Um, here it starts to get a little different with service. You, have, you actually define a service inside of Kubernetes, which is kind of a, um, I would think of it as a 
a logical definition of a grouping, grouping of, pool, uh, of uh, pods and also how to find them and access them. Um, and, and it also load balances requests to the pods, right? So you create a service, you know, that's going to have your, um, uh, your, your static you know, DNS, internal DNS, as well as um, uh, internal DNS name, as well as IP. That's how you would reference the service, and the service is the one that routes the, the request to the different um, pods um, that, contain, that have the containers. That's kind of similar to what you have on the Swarm side with Ingress Network. Um, you know, basically it provides you the, the routes and, um, and load balances requests for different services to the nodes that are essentially that are actually running the task. Um, next, I have the, the nodes um, on the Kubernetes side. You've got masters and workers. Masters are where the master components are running and the control plane is running. That's where you that's what you would connect to and, and send your requests to do things, right? And, uh, send API requests or send a CLI command line interface request directly to one of the masters, and um, it would then it, to the control plane, and it would then kind of route it to the right place. And the workers are where um, the, the pods are going to be running, and that's essentially managed by the control plane. Similar concepts in, in Swarm, where you have your managers and your workers. The managers are going to dispatch your tasks, orchestrate, and kind of manage the state, uh, whereas the workers are, are going to do the execution of the tasks. Um, so continuing down with the, some more key concepts. So thinking about uh, labels and uh, labels, right, inside of Kubernetes. Labels have a really unique purpose inside of Kubernetes where pretty much everything gets a label. And those labels are used to not only, you know, tag things that give it metadata, but also they're used for grouping and finding as well as, um, you know, using uh, routing traffic, right? So, and, and you use selectors to find things that are labeled a certain way. And I'll show you some of this stuff in the demo as well. Uh, on the Swarm side, you're using labels pretty much just for metadata purposes, you know, tagging and so forth. Um, and you can do labels for both sides on pretty much anything. Um, resource requests and limits. So you can, on the Kubernetes side, you can set up limits where you specify kind of the upper bound. You can say, you know, a certain um, uh, namespace, and I'll talk about what namespaces are later. A namespace or application and so forth has a upper limit of how much, how many resources it can get, um, and a request is kind of like the, the minimum, like where an application is defining this is the request that I have and this is how this is what I need for my application, and and um, you can specify resources like CPU, memory, storage, and as of uh, Kubernetes 1.8, we also now support um, custom resources. You can define even go even further than that. Um, on the Swarm side, you also do have the concept of resource limits. When you do a Docker run command, you can provide a configuration flag. Uh, and again, there you also have some, some, some of the similar um, uh, resources like CPU, memory, block IO, and so forth. Um, when you get the role-based access control, uh, this, is, this is where it starts to get a little, little different where in Kubernetes upstream, there is the idea of role-based role -based access control, like roles and role bindings, and you can set those things up at a cluster level as well as at a namespace level. Um, on the Swarm side, the only way you get RBAC is um, you've got to be on Enterprise Edition, either standard or advanced, otherwise uh, that's not available. Um, same thing goes with multi-tenancy and isolation. Uh, Kubernetes provides a lot of different uh, capabilities around multi-tenancy and isolation. Things like you can do things like network isolation, node isolation. You can also do uh, things like um, affinities, where where thing, where applications want to run together, or or anti-affinities, where applications don't run together. Uh, again, I talked about resource uh, role-based access control and resource quota and so on. So there's quite a few different options for multi-tenancy and isolation in uh, Kubernetes. We actually did another webinar that was focused just on multi-tenancy. It was a a full uh, 30 to 40 minutes, so definitely check that out as well. <laughs> um, uh, but on the, on the Swarm side, again, multi-tenancy is only available if you're um, an enterprise edition advanced. Um, some of the key differences, Kubernetes, once you start to um, dig into it a little bit, you'll start to see that it is highly configurable and customizable. Um, Swarm tends to be a little easier to get started just because it's pre-bundled into the, the Docker engine, and you can just essentially uh, start a Swarm cluster uh, with just a few commands. Uh, and Kubernetes feels like it's got a higher barrier of entry, but you'll notice uh, very quickly that um, you start running up against limitations in Swarm when you want to run things a certain way or, or configure things a certain way. Uh, for example, in Kubernetes, you could choose your own runtime, right? So you don't have to use Docker if you don't want to. Um, uh, 
uh, from a networking perspective, you know, on the Swarm side, you only have a uh, the overlay networking, whereas um, in Kubernetes, you get um, you get a lot more options, right? So you get different networking plugins that you can use, things like Flannel, Canal, Calico, and so on. Um, service discovery and routing tends to be tends to be pretty straightforward and easy within Kubernetes, even even as you grow and, and continue to scale. Um, and of course, I talked a lot about the the vibrant community that's there, right? So it's a large and vibrant community that continues to grow, which is uh, only benefiting uh, end users and, and providing more and more kind of um, uh, enterprise capability to different uh, different users. Um, so these are based on some of the some of the issues and challenges that we've seen. Um, these are kind of based on some experiences that we had with uh, a few of our customers. Um, the examples that I'm giving here were based on, I think it was a customer that had about 300 or so microservices and they you know, were trying to get it into production. And as they started to move from dev test and into production, they started running up against all kinds of different issues, uh, you know, starting from like resource limitations. Uh, as, as resources started to get tapped out in, inside their swarm cluster, they were seeing um, services become missing entirely or maybe inaccessible. Uh, they had issues with the fact that when you deployed something, it was it was exposing a port across the whole cluster, which was making it difficult for uh, from the networking perspective, right? Um, you know, you're essentially you're essentially you know exposing that port and putting putting um, nodes behind HA proxies, and if if, uh, if a node didn't stay up or if a node went down, then that uh, that uh, the traffic would would you know go nowhere. Uh, so they were just, they were definitely running into a lot of issues when they, as they were starting to scale. And uh, the way they were fixing them were to create their own blue code, if you will, right? Make, plugging their plugging the holes themselves, creating their own um, uh, creating their own uh, applications that, that were essentially helping uh, helping patch the, the places where they were running into issues. And that started to become harder and harder for them to manage. That's when they started to look at Kubernetes, and they saw that a lot of the things that they were struggling with were just pretty much out of the box with Kubernetes, right? And things just just worked the way that they were supposed to, even as as you were scaling up. Um, and that's when we ended up working with them significantly and kind of making them successful with Kubernetes and Tectonic. Um, so those are some of the kind of the key comparisons. So the next thing I wanted to do was uh, jump in and just, just take you through a fairly simple demo of we're going to deploy an application, we'll, we'll you know, scale it, we'll, we'll make some changes and take a look at it just so you can get a feel for what the uh, Kubernetes command line and so forth looks like. Let me bring over my... Uh, command prompt here, and I think you guys can all see that. So I've got a little split screen here where on one side I've got access to um, a Kubernetes cluster, so we'll just do kubectl cluster-info just so we can see some information about my cluster. All right, and then on this side I'm, I'm connected to a, um, a Docker Swarm and I'm, I'm um, SSH into a master, uh, into a master node, so I can do you know, things like Docker node ls. And so those are my, my different uh, nodes. Um, just for comparison's sake, we can also do that here. Kubernetes get nodes, right? Um, and you can kind of see some of the similarities in the in some of the commands here as well, All right? Um, so let's um, let's uh, take a quick look. See if I've got anything deployed already. Doctor service ls. I guess I've got nothing here. And then in my uh, Kubernetes side, I've got a lot of namespaces. Let's get to see what the namespaces are. Okay, webinar so it's Kubernetes. I'll get um, if there's any deployments already in the namespace uh, webinar. That's where I'm going to be deploying all my things on the Kubernetes side. No resources found. Perfect. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start creating some things here. Uh, so first, let's go ahead and uh, run a, uh, a Docker service create command, which um, if you're familiar with that command, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a service called Hello World, and I'm exposing that at uh, port 80. Um, and the image that I'm pulling is coming from uh, Quay.io, which is our uh, uh, which is our public SaaS um, container uh, registry. Um, you know, so I'm just pulling that image here, version 86. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the Kubernetes side. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and do a simple command here to run Hello World. And again, I'm going to give it the image and, as well as uh, the port that I want it to run and also the number of replicas. So you see replica 3, replica 3, so that's kind of what I'm doing here. And I'm also specifying the namespace of where it goes. So it's already, you can already kind of see some of the, the isolation and things that are there, right? Um, just, just out of the box, you get some, um, some work level isolation at least and you can start to segregate the, the work that you're doing. Um, next, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a service as well. 
Uh, on the on the Kubernetes side, as I mentioned, you have kind of an abstraction. You, you split the two things up, where there is a service, and then there is a uh, and then there is a deployment. Um, so uh, I just created a service that's going to essentially route the traffic to uh, the deployment, right? And I can take a look at what's actually deployed here. So let's do QCTL, get deploy, and webinar, right? So that'll show me that I've got three three things deployed. Right, and uh, if I do the same thing here, QCTL, not QCTL, <laughs> Docker service ls. Okay, so there's my there's my um, uh, Docker service that's deployed with with three replicas. Uh, and now I should be able to hit both of these. Um, on the Kubernetes side, I actually have an ingress that I created. So if I do QCTL get ingress um, dash n webinar, and I'm going to do wide so I can see more information about it. Um, and you can see that my ingress is pointing to webinar.se, this one right here. So we'll just go to that site real quick. And let me open up my browser. We'll open up the tab. So that's, that's the application I just deployed sitting on um, Kubernetes. And then same way, I've deployed it also on the Docker side. And for Docker, I'm just going to go directly to one of the um, uh, IPs in the cluster. And if once I do that, then I should be able to just uh, route the traffic there. So come over here, open up another tab, go there as well. Oh, this is an old version. Refresh, there it is. Okay, so um, so that's uh, the application that's that's running on in Kubernetes as well as on the Docker Swarm side. So let's do a couple of other things. We're going to um, update the image to run a different version, uh, just to see what that command looks like. And uh, we'll do the same thing on the both sides. We'll, we'll do that on the Kubernetes side, and then we'll do that on the Docker side as well. So here is the command. It's just a simple command. Basically, I'm doing, um, you know, setting the image of this deployment to a new version. I had deployed version 86. I'm changing it to version 84. Um, and then I'll do the same thing over here on the Docker side. We'll do Docker service, and then we will uh, update this as well. And I'm going to run this command, right? So basically what that's going to do is it's going to um, uh, do the same kind of thing, basically change from one version to another. Um, and you can actually see on this side kubectl get pods. And again, I'm going to do get pods for uh, what the pods that are in my webinar namespace. And you can see that these have just been running for a few, you know, 30 something seconds because I just redid them, right? Because I redeployed it. Um, so now if I go back to my browser and I refresh it, you'll see both of these start to show the new version. There's Kubernetes, now it's CoreOS plus Kubernetes, there it is, right? Um, pretty simple Nginx application, nothing special, just deploying uh, just a simple, um, uh, displaying a simple HTML, um, uh, HTML page. Um, so what we'll do is we'll scale this out and then we'll start poking around a little bit inside the cluster and, and looking at different things. So if I do a scale command on the Kubernetes side, basically what I can do is I can uh, specify the number of uh, pods so that I come in here and run the command so you see the get pod now is showing five. Before it was three, now it's up to five. And we'll do the same command on the um, on the Docker side, which is um, Docker service scale. So you can see I can I'm scaling that out as well on the Docker side. And um, and if I get information about um, if I get information about uh, my service, I'll see that there's now five pods running, right? So if I can Docker service ls, you can see that there's now five running. Um, so let's just keep going down a little bit. And um, basically what I'm going to do next is uh, uh, poke around a little bit and take a look at uh, uh, some of the details that you have available to you, right? So for example, on the, on the Kubernetes side, I can do get service. Um, Dash n webinar. I can spell. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll do that. And then what that does basically is it just gives me information about the service itself. And then you can see. Remember, I talked about labels and selectors. So you can see the selectors here is uh, run equals hello world, right? And what that's doing essentially is this service is kind of standalone. It's, it's kind of a headless service, if you will, right? It doesn't really have have anything behind it until something is running that has this label, right? So I could create the service first, and it could just be sitting there until I do the deployment. And then once I do the deployment with this label, run equals hello world, then automatically the service will now start routing 
to my uh, uh, to my to my application to my pod. Um, if I describe the kubectl describe describe deploy, and the interesting thing about Kubernetes is that there's a lot of abbreviations. So I can say deploy or I can say deployment. It's both would work. Um, hello world, and that's my um, my hello world application. So it gives me a little bit of information. Kind of shows me the YAML of the the templates is there. Um, uh, it also gives me a lot of good information about kind of um, you know, like what are the labels, the selectors, what's the current number of replicas. And if I scroll down, it actually shows me the events as well when I do that describe command. That's somewhat similar to kind of the inspect command on the Docker side. Right? So if I do Docker service inspect, um, there's a pretty world. And so it kind of gives me some of that similar data that, that you would see with a Docker inspect command. Um, you know, showing me the number of replicas and, and also the image that's running and so forth. All right. Um, so on the on the Kubernetes side, uh, let's poke around a little more and like take a look at a few more things. So I mentioned that you can do things like um, and I'm writing Docker instead of kubectl. <laughs> I'm flipping back and forth. Um, so I can do things like um, uh, set up role-based access control and so forth. So if I do kubectl get um, cluster uh, role, right? Um, this will actually show me all the different uh, roles that are defined inside my cluster right now. Um, this should actually be quite a lot because um, we've, we've been using this cluster and, and creating a lot of different things. Oops, I spelled it wrong. Cluster, oh, two R's. Cluster role. Um, so quite a bit, quite a different, bunch of different roles in here. Um, I can look at a uh, CTL get cluster role and um, Look at one specific one, which is my viewer role. Do you, you know look at the YAML if I wanted, right? And this this is essentially showing me how that role is defined if I was to define it using the YAML. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of there's, there's a lot of things that you can configure in the on the Kubernetes side that you that give you the ability to essentially limit access to different resources. I, I think I mentioned this earlier, um, and you can do that through the command line, kind of what I'm doing here, or you can also um, uh, you can also do it through the, the core OS, the tectonic UI. Let me just show you that really quickly. So if you were, if you were to use, um, uh, if you were using core OS tectonic, which is what I'm showing you on the screen here, uh, you do have a UI for this as well. So the same thing that I'm showing on the command line, the, the view user, this is kind of the YAML version, and this is the UI version of everything. And if I wanted to make changes, I could come in here and do edit. Instead of having to edit a YAML, um, I could do it directly through the UI as well. And so there's, there's quite a, quite a few benefits there, just to make it a little bit easier for you to manage. Um, the other things that you can also do is uh, I did talk about um, kind of the, the the network isolation capabilities, right? So the ability to basically um, set up um, set up applications that only are accessible either inside the network or for from um, um, I'm sorry inside the cluster or from one namespace to a different namespace and so on. So you can there's, there's a whole idea of setting up network policies to give you isolation. Uh, so if I do kubectl get network policies, what this will show me is oh, uh, maybe all namespaces. So it will just show me all of them. Uh, so these are just some network policies that have been already pre-created here. Um, what this is essentially doing is, like for example, that one default deny, right? If I do get network policies and I do default deny, um, let's go ahead and do that. If not in all namespaces, that's going to be in dash n policy demo, and then we can do. I'll put that into YAML, right? So I can do dash o YAML, and that'll just show me the actual YAML of this. So you can see default deny. Basically, the pod selector is nothing, so so it's not going to allow uh, anything to, to access whatever I apply this network policy to. Uh, I can do the same thing again through the Tectonic UI as well. Like if I come into the routing, there's a network policy tab. If I wanted, I could uh, the, the default deny one is here, but if I wanted to create a new policy, I can do that here. Start start uh, editing the YAML. And there's also a lot of templates that we provide to kind of give you that uh, the, the network um, the, the network policies that you can that you can set up and configure. Um, coming back, um, the other thing that I that I wanted to touch upon was um, uh, was basically the idea that that I don't have to do everything through the, the kubectl you know and, and and doing the kinds of commands that I was doing earlier. 
let's go ahead and actually delete some of the stuff that we were creating. So we'll just do a docker remove, uh, remove command. So we'll do docker service rm hello world. All right, so the folks that are familiar with um, compose, you can set up docker compose files. So I'm going to show you something similar on the Kubernetes side as well. Let's go ahead and delete the deployment and then also delete the service. QCTL, delete service, hello world. Um, right, so you notice instead of calling a service, I call it SVC this time, right? So again, abbreviations in many different places. Um, so now what I'll what I'll do is uh, let's Sublime real quick. And um, inside of Sublime, you'll see that I've got a few different cube configs. Oh, not cube configs. I want to go into manifest files, and to the one that I wanted to show was um, this one here. So the same things that I was essentially creating from the command line using kind of the kubectl commands, I can also uh, provide a a manifest file that essentially will um, uh, that essentially will create the same things for me. So I can create the definitions here, get a little bit more specific, and, and provide other things that I can't necessarily do in the command line. Um, so if I wanted to get give more labels, or if I wanted to, you know, provide uh, define the storage and so on, I can do a lot of those things here. Or also, if I wanted to combine things and and deploy multiple and create multiple things in one shot, I can also do that. I can have a single YAML file or, uh, or multiple YAML files. This could be YAML or it could be JSON, depending on whichever one you prefer. Um, so just to, just to show you what that looks like real quick, let's jump over here. So I'm just going to do a, a create, and you'll see it created the deployment and it created the service. And if I come back to um, if I come back to Sublime, you'll see. You know, so I'm defining the deployment first, and then I'm defining the service next, right? So kind of creating both things very quickly um, and, and pushing them out. And again, if I come back to uh, my my I'm sorry, if I come back here, get pod. So you'll see the, the time up is just 27 seconds, right? Because I just created those. And if I do a, and I can also quickly delete everything because if all I have to do is just provide the delete command and point to the same manifest file. And then once I delete it, then um, uh, it's going to delete delete the things that I just created. And if I do get pod, you know they're they're um, no longer no longer there. Um, the nice thing about using the, the manifest files, obviously, is because you can. Um, uh, you can start to version control these things and, and keep a track of what it is that you're actually deploying. Um, so it gives you a lot of it gives you a lot of flexibility, kind of in in what you're going to actually um, uh, store and how you're deploying it and versioning what what you're deploying into your into your cluster, especially once you start to go from you know, dev to test and, and to production and so forth. A um, couple a couple of other things to talk about. Um, uh, there there is this whole idea of um, uh, managing uh, different parts of the cluster, basically, like, like ma I'm sorry, managing multiple clusters as well. So another thing that we've started to work on is um, uh, is this whole idea of having multiple clusters, right? So if you've got a cluster on prem, if you've got one in in you know, on AWS, if you've got one in Azure, and you want to start to bring those together and have a single uh, pane of glass, if you will, to manage those clusters. We've actually started to integrate those things together and, and provide multi-cluster capabilities. So here you can see my three clusters that I've got. One is a bare metal cluster, another one is AWS, another one is Azure, and I also have the ability to um, label these things, right? So if I do show labels, um, that'll show you the kinds of labels that I've associated to them. And again, I talked about labeling strategy earlier. Uh, these labels, even at the cluster level, what they allow me to do is I can create policies that will apply to different clusters, right? So if I had three, four, five, how many of our clusters? And you know, some are tagged production, some are tagged test, and whatever. I can then set up things like namespaces, um, uh, uh, you know, access uh, into the cluster, like role bindings and so forth. And I can do that at using a policy, so that it gets applied to all of my clusters, as opposed to having to go to individual clusters and setting up all those different kinds of things. Um, and th this is available on the command line, but of course, it's uh, in the Tectonic UI as well. So here, you'll see if I hit the drop-down menu, I can flip around between my different clusters. So this is my AWS cluster. Um, I've also got one for Azure. Right? I flip over to the Azure cluster, and then you can see the URL change at the top. You know, it's got the, uh, the Azure DNS cloud app .azure .com and so forth. Um, so that's kind of giving you uh, giving you a lot of uh, uh, giving you a lot of uh, 
capability to kind of make it easier for you to actually flip around and, and manage multiple clusters. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to show from a uh, from a quick demo perspective, just to give you a feel for the Kubernetes command line, as well as give you a feel for kind of what the manifest files look like and so forth. Um, and then uh, let's let's go back to the slides, and then we will continue there. Right, let's go back over to my slides view, and then we'll do presenter and uh, share my screen real quickly. Oops. Oh no, that's the right place to be. Okay, perfect. Um, Hold on one second. Just gonna maximize this. So um, let's jump ahead next. So there's quite a lot of different. Um, uh, projects and things that you can that you can look into as you're starting to come up to speed with Kubernetes and things that you should be aware of. I just listed a few here that I think are important. Uh, some of these are created by CoreOS um, that are kind of core components. Um, others that, uh, that I haven't listed here, you know, that are also very important. But at the same time, um, these are just a few that you should probably just you know just some research on and look into. I'll just run through them real quick. Like etcd, that's essentially the the um, uh, the key value store that maintains the state of Kubernetes, and every Kubernetes cluster has an SCD cluster that's that's behind it, um, and essentially it's doing, you know, uh, it's managing all the the state and kind of keeping track of everything. Um, Claire, which is a security scanning project, that's one that allows you to scan your containers and uh, uh, for known vulnerabilities, so you know that what you're deploying into um, uh, what you're deploying into your your production, you know, or into dev test has vulnerabilities or not. Uh, Prometheus is a monitoring solution that we bundle very tightly with inside of Tectonic. Uh, it's, it's another one that we're participating in. It's an open source project as well. You know, that's a good one to, to know about. Compose is, is, is an interesting project if you haven't looked at that yet. It, it gives you the ability to take your uh, Docker Compose files and convert them to Kubernetes uh, manifest files, uh, which is interesting. I'm, you know, I haven't played with it enough myself to uh, Tell you how well it worked, but it definitely looks like a really interesting project uh, for anybody that's, that's trying to migrate. One that you should look into. Helm charts um, and Helm um, is is another project that's that's quite different and, and interesting to look at as well. It gives you the ability to essentially package Kubernetes applications and um, and deploy them as a as a unit. So if you've got uh, applications that have different um, components that all need to be deployed together and, and set up. And so forth. Uh, Helm makes that easier for you, easier for you as well. Um, uh, container Linux, of course, Chorus is Container Linux. It's definitely one of the one of the best OSs for running container-specific workloads. One of the most popular as well. Uh, definitely another one to look at because um, that's kind of how we run how we run um, Tectonic. You know, runs on top of uh, Chorus Container Linux. So those are some of the some of the open source projects that you should be thinking about. Um, and, and you know, so like you like you saw, getting Kubernetes up and running and, and start doing some simple deployments and all that stuff is very easy, very easy to do, and, and you know, you can get up and running in minutes, I would say. Uh, when you start to get into production or you start to think about scale, then there's a lot more, other, a lot of other things that you need to start thinking about, right? Or things that you need to plan plan for, right? So things like, how am I going to handle disaster recovery? How am I going to handle uh, metering and, and chargeback. If I've got multi-tenant environment, right? How am I going to um, manage multiple environments? If I've got on-prem environments and cloud environments and so forth, how am I going to do uh, monitoring and alerting of my cluster? How do I do upgrades of the whole stack, right? So those are kind of some of the things that require more thinking and planning and, and, and uh, you know thinking ahead before you start to, to go into production. And what, what we think is that if you're working with the right partner uh, in that journey, then essentially you have the ability to reduce your risk, right? So uh, reduce the cost of infrastructure, improve the time to actual value, um, eliminate some of that that uh, that uh, cloud vendor lock-in, as well as uh, make your infrastructure team's life a lot easier, right? And, uh, and and it gets you from kind of that that install to to operating in production. It allows you to shrink that time if you're working with the right partner. And, and what do we think is what kind of partner do you, is one that you should be looking for? Essentially, one that provides an enterprise platform, right? That's got the capabilities that you need. Things like um, the ability to have a portability across clouds, the ability to give you automated operations, right? Then are you the ability to install easily, the ability to upgrade easily, and so on. Uh, it should be a vendor that's, uh, that you're working with that's basically providing you the latest open source components, right? 
um, and giving you a lot of the out-of-box security, monitoring, alerting, uh, metering, and chargeback, and those kinds of things kind of out of the box, right? Um, and, and that partner should also have kind of expertise in the space, uh, significant deep expertise. And those of you that can guess, you know where I'm headed with this, right? <laughs> uh, essentially, you want somebody who's been leading in this space for quite a number of years, has, has uh, worked on container management solutions, has, has that, that deep engineering expertise um, provided through you know, field engineering, provided through support, and so on, um, in, and is known to do that in the, in the space. Right? And essentially, CoreOS, we are definitely that right uh, expert to help customers on that journey. Um, essentially, we built the, the, you know, a lot of the projects that are in this space, so Container Linux being one of them, which is um, the first, I would say, most popular uh, OS for running containers. Uh, and then just going kind of up the, up the line there or down, down the list there, either way you want. But basically, the, you know, we create, we're the creators of SCD, which is the, the heart of Kubernetes. You know, we, we invented the container networking space, essentially, um, which with Flannel and, and um, being founding members of the CNI. Um, you know, and we've, we've essentially been leading these projects for quite some time uh, and one of the leading contributors to Kubernetes even today. Right, and the platform that, uh, that we're providing is uh, Tectonic. And you saw me just give you a quick flash of that, and I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but just so you're familiar with it at a really high level, at the core of Tectonic is 100% open source upstream Kubernetes, and as well as other uh, upstream you know, open source solutions. So things like um, the, the Container Linux operating system, like the Docker runtime, and so on. Right? And even the, the value add solutions that we're providing outside, which are in the green, um, most of those are also based on completely open source solutions, right? Essentially, um, things like Prometheus for monitoring and learning. We're just taking our best practices and, and pre-configuring it for you. Grafana for dashboarding, again, pre-configuring it for you, right? Um, you know, and then the, the um, security and identity management, that's through another project that, we, that we're leading, which is called DEX, right? So that's integrated tightly as well in Tectonic. Um, the open cloud services are all open source solutions that we're essentially providing you automated operations for. So things like install, ongoing running, and maintenance of those uh, open cloud services, uh, as well as uh, the ability to uh, do backups and recovery and so on. Um, and so that's kind of at a high level what the what the platform provides. And of course, the um, the platform also runs on uh, uh, multiple environments, as I mentioned earlier. Right? So we can deploy applications to all different clouds and so forth. Um, just a touch upon kind of some of the companies that we've helped on this journey uh, to Kubernetes and just give you some examples. Uh, I took the customer names off, I'm just going by the uh, what uh, business they're in. Um, but basically, if you think about, you know, these are some of the, the great results that we're seeing, and this is just three examples. We've got, a, we've got a much bigger list here of customers that we've been partnering with and helping them on their containerization journey. Um, you know, one company was able to decrease their AWS bill by 70% just because you know, they were having um, sprawl with all the different EC2 instances and all the different um, you know, machines that they were setting up and clusters they were setting up and it was starting to get, become a headache and then when they tried to adopt Kubernetes, they were having trouble with, um, uh, with kind of getting, it, getting hardened into the scale that they wanted. So with our partnership, they were able to significantly reduce their AWS bill. Um, the, a couple of other examples here as well, I won't dig too deep into them, but basically another, another company, we helped them reduce their um, limit speed. They went from being able to get applications out in, within 24 hours down to one hour, right, when they had a new release. Um, uh, another company that's essentially um, using the pre-built monitoring solutions that are, that are provided with Tectonic as opposed to uh, going out and purchasing um, some third party and, and deploying that, and they were able to cut their costs of, of the overall kind of operations of their applications and uh, of their cluster significantly, right? Um, so yeah, the so core OS at a, at a high level, definitely the right partner for you for your migration to Kubernetes as you're starting to, to think about this journey and starting to uh, plan it out. Um, that's pretty much what I had today, and uh, that's what I wanted to cover. If you have any questions, definitely uh, feel free to put them into the, into the, the chat right now, and I'll, I'll take a look. Um, but of course, if you want to follow up, definitely we can follow up uh, as well. And these are just a few links that you should check out, you know, coreos.com slash tectonic or coreos.com slash blog. And of course, uh, we're also hiring, so if anybody's interested, take a look at the uh, careers page as well.
Let me jump over here and I'm going to take a look at the questions. Um, Okay, so we've got a, all right, so we've got a few questions here. Um, so how do you handle storage uh, for, for um, you know, staple type applications and so forth? And that's actually a good question and I'll, and I'll um, over here, let me share my, I think I'm still sharing my screen, which is good. So I'm just gonna go to, well, uh, and we'll do, Storage class. So this is uh, this is definitely an interesting resource. Kubernetes.io, great documentation there. CoreOS.com also has really tremendous documentation. Um, but if you're looking to see what types of things we support and so on, um, you can come down here. Uh, so we actually have a lot of different. Uh, Kubernetes has a lot of internal provisioners for storage. And what this means is that if I create a application that requests storage or an application that requests a volume, um, as long as I have one of these internal provisioners set up that Kubernetes can actually dynamically uh, create, the, create the volume for me on the fly, which is, which is pretty slick. And then um, as I, as I, and I, can, and I can kind of configure how that should happen, whether the storage should go away if the application goes away or whether the storage stays. And so there's, there's a lot of configuration that can be put in, but it's really nice to have the internal provisioners because you can quickly spin up things. Another thing you should look into if you're, if you're thinking about stateful applications, uh, Kubernetes has a concept of um, uh, stateful sets. All right, so if I go here, uh, I just like to use Google search. It makes it easier. Sets, right? So if you do, if you come to stateful sets, that's another one that um, uh, that you should look into. Uh, stateful sets make it really easy. So I showed you deployments. There's a few other things, that, uh, a few other ways to deploy applications. Um, if you're deploying a stateful application, stateful sets is definitely a very powerful way to do it. Um, another way to do it is daemon sets. That that's if you want them to run on given nodes and so forth of those things to uh, look into as well. Um, uh, networking, what do we support in Tectonic from a networking perspective? I mentioned overlay. Um, so yeah, I, the, the three that I actually mentioned, those were the ones that we support so out of the box. Uh, CoreOS essentially like created the space from a networking perspective for, uh, uh, for Kubernetes with Flannel and, and with defining the, the CNI. And uh, so we support Flannel out of the box and we also support um, uh, we also have started to support uh, Calico, uh, which is another one that was created by the guys over at Tegera. And then there's also a joint project called uh, Canal that we also support. Um, uh, do you support um, Istio? Oh, so Istio is an interesting one. That's um, one that we are uh, keeping a really close eye on. Um, just like you know, Kubernetes has kind of won the orchestration space and, and kind of has, has been leading that space. Istio seems to be winning its, in its own category and kind of like that service mesh category. Um, and um, for those that are not familiar with Istio, it essentially provides like a, a service mesh that uh, runs on top of Kubernetes and acts as like, um, a, uh, like a network between the different various uh, microservices that you might have running, right? And it gives kind of um, some, some traffic management, right? Um, and it allows you to kind of see the dependencies and also how the traffic is flowing and so on. But yeah, I mean, long story short, we're keeping a close eye on it and, and uh, you know, as you see that project kind of move more towards being donated to the CNCF, then uh, definitely you'll see us as well as uh, start to build which and, and include it. Definitely a lot of interest in that one. Um, those are all the questions that I'm seeing for now, so I think, um, we can uh, we can uh, end the presentation and if you have any other if anybody has any other questions of course uh, feel free to reach out to us as well on uh, you can you can find us on uh, coreos.com thank you everyone